back to Berlin for Rogue vs. Splice, where the newcomers look to bounce back after going 0-2 last week. Of course, it is always hard when you come in as a new organization. You have to work on all that synergy with your new players. But for Rogue, though, their first games with the new lineup didn't look very promising. It didn't, and... I really spent a lot of time looking at Rogue, looking at the organization, looking at the players. And for me, it's just, it's a big steaming pile of question marks because I still don't know what to expect from players like Profit, like Sankax, like what did. I have expectations that are higher, but I didn't see them living up to it. And I just, I don't know how I feel or what direction they're going to go. Yeah, I agree with you. It is also tough to think where they will attack the enemy teams that they're playing and, and who's going to step up. But there must be someone we are looking at to take it there. And my eyes are on Kikis. Kikis has been through it all. You know, he was on that successful G2 lineup. He brought vitality to the top back in summer. So I'm expecting a lot from this guy in this roster. And I have similar expectations of him. We talked a lot about him and what did last week. Yeah. And I think that when we look back at them uh, in week one, they were very much in a not favorable situation because <laughs> you have two junglers that are very aggressive in Max Law and Cadrill, and they take their aggression to the next level by looking for opportunities as early as level two. And when you're still trying to gel as a team and when you're still figuring out who you're relying on to be that primary carry, I'm okay with them not having the best performance. Yeah. And moving into this week, and I'll look at how Splice have played, a typically much slower team, a team that likes to take their time, is a little bit more patient. Now I think we can see more of the aggressive Kadrill that we saw from last year. So basically uh, what you're saying is um, Kadrill? Kick Kick us. Kick us. Kick us. Yes. Uh, what you're saying is that from the side of Rogue, yes, they went on too, but they are a new configuration. We need to give them some time, and I think this is a great match to look at what they could be because Splice is still very much the very same old same Splice. And I don't mean that in a bad way. Well, maybe if it keeps going, but they get went one and one in week one and they got their win off putting Kavi on a late game carry Shucks. and playing to the league. I have to jump onto what you just said. Splice, it doesn't matter the players. It doesn't <laughs> matter the year. It doesn't matter the meta. Splice just somehow seem to play for late game team yeah. fights. They like to go mellow it, and it slow an early. And it is true, right? They are a slightly less effective version of CLG EU for any of the older <laughs> fans out there. They like to farm up, they like to play late. I actually think this is an opportunity where Xerxes' slower early game could be punished by Kikis. So I'm, I'm hopeful that Rogue can play to their strengths and maybe punish some of Splice weaknesses. Mm -hmm. But that also means it's very clear for Splice where they should focus their preparation for this week and this game in particular. Yeah, absolutely. And for me, it feels like that this is just the step-by-step -step process that Splice likes to go through when they're developing a new team because I think back to spring of 2018 from last year when the new roster was announced with Odoamne and Niski and how they just took time before they reached that point where they just stormed through the split. You know, they were like five and five yep. until week six and then all of a sudden they just turned a switch on and they were really aggressive and really proactive. And I guess what I want to see with these kind of players, especially with how promising Humanoid has looked, that we see that switch flick on a little earlier in the split. Yeah, and I think it has to be possible if you look at a Humanoid's week one performance. The guy in the mid lane did great. He had a crushing Aatrox performance. He simply seemed confident on the Rift, seemed to be working well together with Xerxes and what as well. So when I'm looking at these Splice games, that does make me very hopeful for what they can build into. If Humanoid can live up to the hashtag Tag EU mids man. Yes, I think it is a weapon that can be unlocked to help Splice climb up the standing. Yeah, and I'm really excited to see him play again today. I think that against Senkux, he should have a very favorable matchup. Uh, you'll kind of have the original Splice mid laner versus the new rookie yeah, mid laner, good point. which I think is quite exciting to see. But he's a new young talent. I think he holds a lot of promise. I was quite uh, impressed with what he showed us last week. And I think that if the team just invests a couple more resources into him, he could be a big carry threat for the squad. Yeah, I love that. He holds a lot of promise. And for me, he holds the promise of a new splice if they keep investing in him. We'll see what it turns out to be. And with Humanoid in that mid lane splice, they look to take the next step towards the top of the LEC. Let's see if they can start by getting a 2-0 and zero week. Thank you very much, Shox. Well, Rogue stand in the way of that 2-0 week. And Rogue, last week... <sighs> If they were one of my patients, I would have said the prognosis was looking bleak. Thank goodness you're not a doctor. Yeah. Anymore. 
That's an important distinction to make. It's, it's the only thing I have going for me, okay? Well, you got this right now. That's true. That's, that's a good <laughs> part. But yeah, Rogue really struggled last week. I think that's, it's important to note that they were against some very strong opposition uh, in the form of G2 and then against XL. It was quite a back and forth game and they just quite, weren't a, quite able to get over the finish line. And for me, I, I like what the analyst just kind of teed up and it's this idea that if we're focusing on Kikis as kind of the ignition point for Rogue to really get started, he ran into a uh, high level competition in the form of Maxlor and then he ran into very aggressive jungler in the form of Kadrill. And I feel like with Xerxes playing more of the Sejuanis and the Zacks, maybe there's this window where Kikis can actually get things started for Rogue and we actually get to see what this team is made of. Because I know who Kikis is, I know who Wadid is, I know who Synkux is, but I don't know what Rogue is. I don't know what they look like when they actually get to play their style. They've got to show us what they've got, right? They've got to prove to us that they are Rogue as an organization, not just five individual players. Uh, on the other side of the rift, of course, Splice, Going one-on-one -on -one in week one isn't always what you want. It's almost like a completely different problem, too. Exactly. You don't even know who's on Splice. Like, you just cover up the nameplates, but you know exactly how they're going to play League of Legends. Is they the game over 35 <laughs> minutes long? Did the AD carry get a pentakill? Yes, it's Splice. Excellent. Which is crazy because, again, it feels like Splice made all the right moves in their roster to take them from uh, gatekeepers to gate crashers. You know, you have a hyped mid laner now in Humanoid. You got Norskaren up in that, uh, or down in that support lane. You have the, you know, Cornerstone player and Kabe. They're always going to build around him. And then you have the Chachi and Xerxes synergy. Like the last time those guys really thrived was when they were working together. So, you know, ticking every single box, it, it feels like the roster and off season moves that Splice made, made perfect sense. Definitely did. I have to remember the last time Xerxes and Chachi were on a team together, it was Unicorns of Love, and they got the rookie of the split and the MVP of the split in the same split, Chachi being MVP and Xerxes being the rookie. So we want to see a little bit more from them. Want to see a little bit more from that top lane and maybe want to see Chachi off the Scion because he played that two times last week and uh, it's fine. You know, it's, it's Scion, right? You can't really shine on Scion. It's interesting. It felt like there was a, a lot of picks across the board from all the LEC teams, kind of back to back for Splice. You know, two games of Scion, uh, you know, two tank junglers in the Zac and the Sejuani. It felt much more consistent in what they were drafting both games. Definitely did now. Let's jump on into picks and bans. That's Rogue on the blue side and Splice on the red. Already the Galio getting removed from Humanoid's pocket and Tom Kench taken away from Wadid. What a surprise. Yep, he's going to have to play something else now. Uh, he and Wadid have been playing very defensive bot lanes despite the fact that they did go for some very early aggression with Kikis. So maybe now that he doesn't have the Kench, he'll grab something like the Rakan, like the Alistar. Although we've seen a lot of Rakan bans globally. Give me the Rakan. I love Rakan, especially on 9.1 before he gets gutted on 9.1. Point two, and you can't play him at all ever. If you play Rakan in solo queue, you're trolling at the moment, by the way. Uh, but give me the Rakan. I think it suits with its playstyle. It gives you a bit more engage, gives you a bit more power in those team fights, and they're gonna ban it themselves. So Irelia Rakan, the final two bans from Rogue, Cassiopeia, the next ban from I Splice. Think that makes a lot of sense when you do look at the names on Splice's roster, like Norskaren and Humanoid. For me, it's kind of those two players that I really want to focus on as being the next X factor for Splice. Again, to take them to that next step other than just playing playoff contenders. There's an Akali band coming out as well, of course, can be flexed between mid and top, but it leaves things like the Aatrox, the Urgot, the Lissandra, all still on the board here. And you would expect that it would be either Aatrox or Urgot, whichever one that your players tend to value more. I like the Aatrox more. I feel like there's a bit more flexibility and it's a bit more confident or we have better players in the LEC on Aatrox. And then it's immediately the swap. Okay, you took Aatrox, I'm gonna take Urgot, maybe a jungler here, which I definitely would fit jungle. <laughs> There you go. He swapped to Dilution. I was like, Diana, I'm ready. You're getting trolled. You're getting trolled. Xerxes always hovers Diana first uh, as a long time tradition for him in the LEC or in the L LCS, of course. Not really a tradition after only one week in the LEC. But as you say, Urgot, Lucian are the picks here for Splice. Kick is looking towards maybe an AD carry, maybe a jungle mid duo here as well. He can secure his bot lane duo if he wants to try to get uh, more information before he uh, curates his jungle matchup. I like that because, again, if uh, you look at Rogue, it's going to be Kikis who's going to jumpstart this team. So he wants to kind of send out the feelers. I like QQ on Ezreal. It's one of the champions that he does have stronger performances on. And we wanted Wadid on a playmaker. Well, he gets that in Braum. Gives you a little bit more poke in that lane as well with the Winter's Bite and some safety. Takes away the Lucian Braun bottom lane from Kobe and Noskarin as well, which is so important to do. Lucian oh no. Braun, so powerful. But oh no, indeed. It's Karthus being picked up here for Humanoid. Could, of course, go to Xerxes as well. Now, here's one of the things. When we have seen Karthus in the jungle at least work, because like you're saying, it still is a flex pick. We saw Vitality play in the mid lane, G2 play exclusively in the jungle. It was in tandem with strong laners like the Aatrox. Now, they still have a strong laner in Lucian and Urgot, but they're 
still time that Rogue can kind of carve out superior 1v1 matchups in their solo lanes, that if this Karthus does get slotted into the jungle, they can maybe try to create some pressure and invade, start blitzing into that Karthus's face to mess him up in the early game. Talk about Kikis being the key man for Rogue. Well, invading a Karthus early is how you shut him down, and that's what Rogue will be looking to do here. Bans Xin Zhao already, Spice say, okay, we're not going to give you that aggressive jungler. Things like the Karzix are still there, the Lee Sin as well, all options. And now Rogue get rid of the LeBlanc, uh, in the mid lane, meaning they think that Karthus is going towards the jungle. And it also means that they think that the uh, Aatrox was going towards the mid lane because taking away Kennen, they're trying to take away any sort of uh, challenge to Chachi up in that top lane. Urgot, one of the only ranged top laners, can really abuse a lot of matchups up there. And Kennen is one of the few champions that Odo showed that can really go toe to toe with Urgot still. Next up, final ban is going to be Thresh in that bottom list. So taking Norskayan away from one of his power pick splice. Probably going to look towards a safe support here. Leave that mid lane or jungle pick for last. That's where I would go. Uh, because you just have a little bit more flexibility there. It would show, though, that that Karthus is slotting into either the jungle or the mid lane position. So I actually like the fact that they're securing their support because it still leaves options open that you don't yep. know where the Urgot's going to slot, you don't know where the Karthus is going to slot, and Splice still have that last trump card for their draft. Is there ever a possibility of Karthus top? That's the that's because we talked about how much flexibility there is. Would you ever think, okay, guys, we've been totally counterpicked on these last two picks. Let's take Carthus into the top lane. Let's pick a powerful jungler here as our final lot. I mean, I would never count it out just because I feel like Cassiopeia can also slot up into the top lane and they uh, serve similar functions when they do lane, which is just to keep it perma pushed. Although that does expose them to ganks, so I don't like them in longer lanes as opposed to shorter lanes. You know, top lane physically longer than mid lane. It's that much farther to get back to safety. So final locks here for Rogue are going to be the Jace, could be top or mid, of course, and then the Sejuani. Not as aggressive an early jungler as perhaps we would have wanted out of Kikis, but his pool was very small when you get rid of the Zinzat. I mean, a lot of people will look at Sej and say, you know, it's all about the level 6, it's all about the scaling, but Sejuani can still do a lot of work in the early uh, phase of the game because she has so much burst potential on her kit early on. So just because I see Sej doesn't mean that it's going to be a slow scaling trip. It could also be a very aggressive Sejuani from Kikis. Well, that's definitely what we hope Kikis was so well known on Vitality for being that catalyst, for being the ignition, the spark that would set games alight here. We'd like to see him do it on the Sejuani into Xerxes Karthus jungle because we have the Lissandra going across towards Humanoid as the final pick. And that does mean that Jace will slot into that mid lane and Aatrox will take on the Urgot Aatrox matchup that dominated the World Championship. I feel like it goes towards uh, Aatrox. Urgot I feel is a bit easier to play, however, and really it is a skill check matchup. Keep our eyes on that top lane to see who is winning out the skill check, but usually you don't see too much action up there either. Maybe the Fear Beyond Death can do a little bit of work from the Urgot, but then you have the World Ender and it's just, it's like, okay, you press your R, I press my R, we equalize it out, good times, all fun and games. We all walk away, but what's not gonna be fun in games is the fact that Karthus got through again. We were asking ourselves the question, is it G2, the only team outside of Vitality that's going to play this? Is it going to infect the rest of the LEC? And it seems so today. And Splice, a team that's known for kind of their slower pace game, longer game times. Now they have such a strong late game insurance policy in that Karthus because eventually he will just be unstoppable. He will just press R and the fights will be over before they begin. Hey, you warned us about it earlier in Ready Check. You were saying this is one of the power picks of the LEC in week one and then Flexius came on. You know, I've never seen Vedius without his top one. I thought he'd be buffer. I thought he'd be bigger than that. But he came on and said power flex picks is very important as well. And we see it in this draft, you know, so many flexes coming through the entirety of the draft. Now that uh, pick and bans are actually through, I want to give a quick update to our fans at home. After exploring issues related to remade champion selects last week, the cause of the bug was being uh, had been determined, and we're in the process of getting that fixed. In the meantime, to protect competitive integrity and avoid any issues during picks and bans, our picks and bans that we just finished are now being completed on a stable test server, well, were completed on a stable test server, sorry. Right now, those picks and bans are being transferred onto a competitive server and the game will play on as normal. This means that we have a small delay between picks and bans and gameplay right now and will temporarily uh, change. This temporary change helps us prevent excessive delays caused by remade champion selects, which is why I had to do that whole spiel and why we have a short delay as we remake pick and ban on a competitive server and then get on into the game. It was just a bit of a mouthful, but we... There was a... I, I practiced it a couple of times and then it just, you know, when it comes, it's just word vomit. Just it's okay, I can't read, so I wouldn't have been able to do that. So, uh, yeah. 
Do you want us to teach you or? No, it's okay. <laughs> okay. Reading Rainbow, I've got it queued up. Reading Rainbow. See, I know that song, but I don't know where I know that song from. Because it was an American TV show, I assume. You guys didn't have Mr. We didn't Rogers? Have, we didn't have Mr. Rogers or Reading Rainbow or anything in the UK. This explains in everything India. that went wrong in your childhood. Hey, many things went wrong in my childhood, but I've ended up here. And what a place to be here is as we wait for Rogue to take on Splice. Rogue, of course, went 0-2 in week one. Now really need to prove to us that they are a team. They're not just a collection of five different players. I mean, frankly, the elephant in the room is that most people are signing Rogue off for dead last in the LEC. I'm not ready to write them off just yet. I feel like they got a bad rap in week number one that they had to run face first into misfits, didn't help, and that this will be the real test for Rogue to at least show us that there is some life left on this roster. Where eyes are on Kikis to do that for them. And onward did, of course, on the Braum in that bottom lane with HeQ, who struggled a little, bit, a little bit last week. I think the problem was I was looking through a lot of the statistics for uh, for Rogue, and you kind of have to get rid of all of their Misfits game because it's just so unfair to them to be like, oh, he was two and a half thousand gold behind at the 15 minute mark. It's like, that's not a normal game of League of Legends. And then you only have one game to look at. And so against XL, the numbers were a little bit more kind, but. The question is whether they can keep up the performance they had against XL or whether we'll see another Misfits-esque thrashing here from Splice. And I did see some good things uh, coming out of Rogue. You know, when you kind of read between the lines of the O2, I like the fact that Wadid was making cross-map plays with this Tom Kench. Of course, he doesn't have that opportunity this time around, but was quite proactive and still stable with it. Uh, Kikis trying to be that aggressive jungler that we know him, but Sincux. You know, Maxler attempted four ganks on Sincux and only killed him once. And yes, he still died in the lane phase, but it was against Lee Sin, Lissandra. Like, eventually it was going to happen, and I do think that he did a, a good time, like, absorbing a lot of that pressure from Misfits. On the other side of the Rift, it's Splice, who had an okay week one. I think they'll be a little bit disappointed that they lost that game to Vitality when it was pretty much in their favor for the majority of it until Attila's Vein got online. But if they can perform like that again, if they continue to do this AD carry, scale into the late game, 35, 40 minute long game, you have to expect they will consistently go one and one or maybe even two and up. But I want more than that from Splice. I have a lot of faith in their coaching staff. They seem to have leveled up support across the board, retaining Peter Dunn, bringing in uh, more assistance for them. And so this is the, the next chapter again for Splice. More than gatekeepers, gate crashers. <laughs> the LEC chapter for Splice. Been around for such a long time as an organization, of course, and Kobe, the only player that stuck with them through thick and thin, went to Worlds with them just a few years ago, and now is trying to champion them, lead the charge towards the top of the table. So who we got to focus on is, of course, going to be that Karthus in the jungle. Now, Karthus very easily can be disrupted in the jungle. He's not super great early on. Now, of course, if he gets the lock-in on the Skittles, he can burn you down quite efficiently. But he's going to be fairly mana dependent and very fragile early on. And he doesn't have a lot of gank windows before level four when he has access to all of his abilities, particularly that wall of pain, to make him so strong in the gank. And with Sejuani and Jace, if you ever get mid lane priority, Rogue need to disrupt this Karthus before he gets going. So really you want to track him early on as well. Understand where he's starting. Expect it to be over towards the blue side. I would think he has to start on the blue side. Very mana dependent champion. Can uh, move through the jungle pretty well though because he does have the AoE Skittle Burst. Noskaren and uh, Kobe actually not going to help out with this blue. So maybe a slightly delay delayed start here for Xerxes. But the Skittles doing extra damage when a target is isolated will help. You can see the 127 magic damage popping up. And Xerxes will just be able to kite this one back. Something, of course, good junglers can do on these range junglers. Take minimal damage from any of the buffs. Yeah, really good kiting from Xerxes and uh, looks very confident and comfortable on the champion. You know, um, you can usually tell the difference on how they're going to kite around the objectives, or excuse me, the monsters, and how much damage they'll take. I think the question, like, as, as much as Rogue should expect Xerxes to start on blue side, how much do they actually know he started on blue side? Like, is it a you have to on Karthus? I'm going like, to say now, now they know. 100%. Yeah, I think now 100%. But until he got spotted on that ward, I was wondering whether there'd still be a little bit doubt of doubt in the minds of Rogue, because they, they didn't see the bot lane. The bot lane went straight down towards bot to push that out quite aggressively. I think it's always going to be a strong suspicion. What I'm curious is if Kikis is, what Kikis is going to do with that information. If he's just going to grab the Scuttle Crab, then return to his buff and um, continue to kind of move through the jungle, or if maybe he's going to look for an opportunity to slip in and maybe contest Karthus early on. But it looks like with the Vision, he's just going to grab Scuttle, and it's going to be a free clear for both jugglers. And just gets Karthus towards that level 40 even quick. You can see he's done a full clear. Gromp alongside the blue, the Scuttle and those wolves. Now gets the fiery chickens. 
and uh, we'll go across towards the red buff. And that extra vision control, that extra little bit of safety from Spice really helps them out in the early game. Hiku getting engaged on here by Norskare, and that aftershock keeps him a bit tankier, stunned up as well, but Kobe and Norskare are doing a good job at the moment. I want to point out the timing window from Senkux there to place that ward on the top of mid side. We can check that Senkux is also running the uh, cleanse, pretty standard across from Lissandra, but it's a lot of respect to recognize Karthus is going to be on the top side of the map. He's probably going to be around that level four window. We saw Yankos be very successful with uh, ganks on the mid lane using the Wall of Pain. And by placing that ward, it's again that heads up play that Senkux is aware of what's happening around him and he's just creating that safety net. Zassi looking for an early-ish gank up towards the top side. We talked about how this is a skill matchup between the Urgot and the Aatrox, but as soon as you make it a 2v1, it becomes a little bit harder. Profit passing down towards the bottom side. A lot of minions here, but as soon as Profit uses this final Q, you have to think they'll go in. Chachi gets the knockback with the disdain, and Profit not in the best of shapes. Flashes away, but Xerxes lands the skittle, tastes the rainbow, Profit's down. And it's just too easy from bad to worse for Rogue right now, because not only is it first blood, but it's first blood on the Karthus. He is well and truly on the springboard. Again, level four, you just have to be aware of where Karthus is going to strike on the map. Profit tried to be safe, got that ward down towards the bottom side, was like, okay, I'm good. But Xerxes snuck in, and was able to get enough damage down to take down the top laner from Rogue. So credit to Xerxes, you know, creative pathing to come in through the back of the lane, make use of the wave that Chachi had set up, and maybe a counter gank here? Nope. Kick is under-leveled compared to Xerxes as well. We talked about how Kick is had to be the one to make plays in the early game for Rogue, had to try and shut down this Karth as well. Immediately, the run in from Xerxes just towards the middle lane. The uh, Wall of Pain comes down as the well. Then the Skittles, the Sankux, fancy feet. Oh, he's too good. He's oh. too, look at that. Dodged all Skittles but one. Oh, that was actually so good from Sankux. Uh, because they, they were trying to force the flash. That's all they wanted there. They're like, okay, we at least force the flash. If not, maybe we'll uh, take the kill if he really wants to hold on to it. But the fancy footwork meant that Sankux got to retain both his summoner spells. And this is what I'm talking about. If you actually read between the lines, Sankux is doing a good job despite what the scoreline or the stats will show. He's trying. Yeah, a lot of people put the failure of Misfits last season squarely on the back of Sankos, but he shows us, you know, he is a good mid laner. He knows exactly what he's doing. Yes, he's not a Caps who will absolutely dominate the game for your team, but he will play effectively in that lane. So he gets the scuttle crab, second one of the game for him. Kikis doesn't know he's there. Just gonna face check straight into this car. This runs out, oh! He's like, in a like, no, I don't want any of that. Oh. Backs away. I think I'd do the same, right? If I was faced with the grim specter of death, I would definitely run away quite quickly. But I, what I loved is the rotation from Norskaren as well. You know, just a little bit late. Can you imagine if Alistar got there a second earlier? So, uh, again, great cross-map communication from Splice. Xerxes is flying through this jungle, so effective on the Karthus, and now also getting a free uh, Infernal Drake. Actually might even hit level 6 before Kickers gets even a level 5. Chachi has his flash up in the top lane, has the ultimate as well. Prophet not got his ult yet, but Kickers looking for his first gank of the game. There's the Infernal Drake, they know Karthus on the bottom side now. Here goes Prophet with the World Ender, running onto Chachi, who tries to get away. The disdain isn't enough, and Chachi will hold on to his flash. He knows he's done for. Prophet secures the kill. And finally on the board and in Prophet's hands. Nice job handing the kill off to the Aatrox. That's what you want for that matchup, especially because now that the TP has burn been burned from Urgot, and he has access to the uh, unseen spellbook. There he goes. He swaps the spell from teleport to ignite. It is so hard to deal with the all-in engage from Urgot once he has the ignite. There's virtually no champion that can deal with him 1v1. So now I'm curious how Prophet is going to deal with this big power window that Chachi has because of the summoner spell change. Chachi holding on to his ultimate in that fight as well means they have the ult advantage in the next battle in the top lane if they do go for it. Bot lane has been uh, pretty quiet, as expected. You know, we, we saw a couple of times Norskaren going for engage. Hiku just jumps away. What's really important is Hiku's itemization. There's always going to be the difference between going for the tier build of Ezreal or uh, hanging around in lane and making sure that you can get the Sheen on the back. And because he's against Lucian, it's so important that Hiku was able to get the Sheen because it meant what was obviously going to be a losing matchup between the ADCs. Hiku now has a foot in it. He can actually now trade pretty effectively with the Lucian as long as he's connecting his W and his Q. And W has such a wide hitbox as well, it's pretty easy to land that Essence Fox and does a huge amount of damage 
if you can find the connection. Uh, speaking of itemization, Senkux went for the Hex Drinker first in the mid lane. No real surprises there when you're playing into a Karthus and a Lissandra. Getting a bit of extra magic with this for yourself makes a lot of sense. It could definitely be the difference maker if they decide to go for these 1v1s and it, the entire map is turned into a 2v1 now that Karthus is post level 6. Doesn't have to be there, can just proc the ultimate, so the Hex Drinker can really be the make or break for Senkux here. I think that's the big thing really, isn't it? The next ultimate from Xerxes, or the first ultimate of the game from Xerxes, is is the deciding moment of the game you have to feel. If Xerxes gets a kill or a couple of kills or an assist from it, then you really think the Spice can accelerate this Karthus towards a victory. But if he's unable to, Rogue should be able to take advantage of that and start pressuring a little bit more. Hold on, Norskaren might actually gank Two-shot barrage, Kobe. Oh, Definitely not anymore. Wait, Norske no, he's going. He knows it. He's in. He's, he's like, oh, back off, mate. That's my AD carry. What are you doing, blood? <laughs> Noskarin's okay, gonna get stunned up as well. Xerxes on his way as well, but Noskarin looking for the stun to connect, gets onto a did. Xerxes running down, has the Wall of Pain, that's the teleport from Spice. They're trying to make this fight into a 3v2. Xerxes puts down the Wall of Pain with did, has this flash still, there's the culling. Where did should survive, the Ignite ticking away. Oh, Requiem! Goodbye, Wooded! And it's just that easy. Xerxes says, nah, let him run. Let's see how far he gets. Oh, Kikis didn't connect, and the Glacial Path from Humanoid will get him away. Just that it's like a final dirge for what we did. He just stands there like, okay. Well, th this was fun, guys. <laughs> I'll see you when I get back from Fountain. Hold on, Xerxes now making his way towards mid. Humanoid has the ultimate. Cleanse still also on Senkus, flash. of course. You don't really want to flash straight into the Jace, though. Kiki is coming in towards the top side. You can see Chachi with a good flash away, looking for the stun to connect, but can't quite find it. And uh, Spice dodging those ganks. Chachi absorbing so much pressure. I feel like that's the third time that he's been consistently ganked up there. So unable to use that big power of having the Ignite as well as the uh, ultimate, simply because it's just a 2v1. So we take a rewind and look back at this bot lane. And it looked pretty dicey for the fact that Lucian couldn't participate, but he's got the TP, he comes back into the fight, Norskaren places the ward for him to come back and get involved on it, and just beautifully executed from Splice. Knowing that they had the Requiem in the back pocket, all they need to do is get wadded under kill pressure. And I like how he holds it to check. Is the Ignite going to kill him? Okay, nah, you're mine anyway. <laughs> That's just so unfair. As a Ganko support main, I'm like... Press that as the yeah. fight was going down. He's like, I don't care if the Ignite kills him. I I'll need kill my him assist. Now. <laughs> but that, that is part of why Karthus is so strong, because you don't actually even need to use the ultimate as a finisher. You use that as your opening gambit. You, you lay that on the table. You say, like, OK, fight us at three quarters HP. Fight us at half HP if you want to, because we're going to win that fight. And that's the big difference between you know this stage of Karthus and late game stage of Karthus, because I agree with you. I think late game, once Karthus has a couple of items, just open up a team fight. Press R. Definitely works out. Just checking how many Dark Harvest stacks uh, Xerxes has at the moment. Only sitting on three. I played Nexus Blitz. You should have more than that by this point in the game. But he does have about a 1,000 gold advantage over his opponent in the form of Kikis, who wasn't the uh, fire starter that we really wanted for Rogue this game. Rogue, of course, not out of it, but they are about 2,000 gold behind. He has a lot more options now that he has his ultimate, though. So Kikis looking to get involved, continuing to gank this Urgot, and again, making sure that this isn't a 1v1, that it's always going to be a 2v1 scenario. The Prophet will clear out this minion. Then you expect Kikis to push forward into the next push. Is Chachi going to push too far forward? Final change comes down. There we are. There's the disdain. Kikis will be looking to go. Lands the Arctic Assault knockup. The stun from the Flail of Northern Winds comes out as well. The connection on the stun underneath the tower. Prophet has enough damage. And that is strong stuff from Rogue in the top lane. And eventually it does pay off as this seems to be the big breaking point for Rogue, throwing everything that they have at this top lane and making sure that Prophet was high enough health that the now available Requiem wouldn't be able to trade one for one top. I guess having the World Ender helps out quite a lot with that as well. Just like, okay, you ult, I ult. Run! Just balance it out, but as you say, <laughs> you, I was trying to just get away underneath his he tower. He was brave! He yeah, saw that Alistair coming straight for him, he's like, uh-uh, not even no. gonna move, not even gonna flinch. <laughs> uh, the amount of times I've 1v1 an AD carry as Alistair with Zeke's convergence, it's actually disgusting. He is I just very strong. love that engage potential on Ali, especially when they uh, stack against the wall, because you can just W them and not have to yeah. use your Q immediately, and you get a little bit more time on the displacement, because you smack them into the wall and then hit the pulverize, as opposed to automatically spamming WQ. As a, as a tip to everyone at home, make sure you do that when they're against the wall, because if you do it and knock them away from your team, you're going to get some question mark pings on you. Had that happen enough times, you don't want that happening. Your team will flame you. It's not good. It's not good, Frost. You haven't experienced EU solo queue yet. I've actually been avoiding it. Yeah. There's some laughs from that. <laughs> we can duo, though. I'll no, be your support. You. You'll be an AD carry. I play good supports, like Lux. <laughs> 
I don't know. I'm, I like I'm, I'm just, a Khan one trick and he just got hard nerfed. We're so. just changing the uh, changing the expectations. You're the support, I'm the ADC. Yeah. It's 2019. We're both bot laners now. <laughs> okay, one of us can carry. Anyway, Riftail was started up here by Kickers. They're going to trade it for the second dragon of the game, which Spice have secured. The Infernal and the Mountain going down there. But that bot lane tower is very low as well. And Spice setting up a three map. I actually like this response from Rogue. They know that bot lane is sacked. Get off the tower. You can't do anything. You see the Mountain Drake goes down, so you know Karthus is going to Zip, uh, zip his way down there and take it for free. So instead, what can you trade on the map? And they grab the Rift Herald, which theoretically should get them a tower in return. So this was best case scenario for Rogue and actually a really good read on the map. 30 minutes in, about a 2,000 gold lead for Splice. And I want to break that down a little bit because we talked about how, you know, if you get late game Carthus, Splice uh, should have this game in the bag. They should win it from here. But Rogue seem content with the pace of the game and the way the game's going at the moment. They're not really hard forcing anything. I don't necessarily know if content's the right word, but they're definitely recognizing where they can attack I think the they're map. just, they're praising the gods of Summoner's Rift that this isn't another Misfits game. That's true. They actually got to play this yeah. one. It wasn't a level This is how you ward. play League of Legends? <laughs> Here we go, round three for profit. Teleport in from Hiku as well. Kobe, just gonna step back. They're you know, suspicious. Oh, you can't blame them, really. Cannot blame them at oh, all. Don't do it, go Kobe. Go on, Kobe, go for it. Don't be greedy. No! He greeds. Profit comes in, but Kobe jumps away straight away. Use the flash, the chase in. Knocked up, still alive, somehow underneath the tower. Eventually we'll go down. North Karen gets the stun off onto Profit, but there's a world end. And now Splice wants to answer this fight. Catch out. Easy kill onto Profit, and Judge has got the teleport in. Say a prayer to your gods, because the Requiem comes down. And Zersi obliterates the health part of Rogue. Goodbye, Rogue. Spice win the fight in the top lane. And whose hand was caught in the cookie jar? Was it Kabe's or was it Rogue? They overextend under the tower, they get over Eager, and the rest of Splice send in the cavalry and clean it up. Senkux uh, might not want to take this fight. Jumps onto Noskera and Zussi's like, oh, hello, my good man. Didn't realize I'd meet you in the river. Good knockout from Noskera and the W into the wall. And Zersei just in the right position to feed Senkux some Skittles, but he's dodged two, he's dodged three. Dance. Senkux gets hit with one, dodges Dance. the next one. Senkux, you're too good! Dance. Senkux, oh, oh my God, Senkux! Holy hell, that was incredible! <laughs> oh my God. Woo! The craziest thing, though, is that Humanoid has Flash and could have gone over the wall, but he looked at Xerxes, he's like, you got that? Xerxes has Flash as well. Like... And Xerxes was just clicking his heart, and he's like, I got it. I, I got, got it. it. I, I got, got it. it. Oh, this replay's brought to you by Alienware, because this was sick. Okay, again, this starts. Kavi, he greets for the minions, and they think, we've got him, boys. They flash forward. They just want to kill this Lucian, but it takes so long to do so, and they eat so much damage from the tower that the rest of Splice shows up and says, you fell into the bear trap. The trap closes, and we're going to take the whole arm. Karthus rips a hold of them, and it looks so good for Splice. And the only thing that they get on the back half is some fancy footwork from Sinkux to make sure that one of their members makes it out alive. He's just too good. It's like watching, I don't know, some sort of cool dance, the KDA dance. It's just like you never know which direction it's going to go. It's like one step to the right, step to the left. Where am I going to go, Zersi? Again, Where am I going to go? Look at Lissandra. Where she am I going to go? Flash. She walked up to the wall and she was just like, Xerxes, you've got this, right? He's like, yeah, yeah, this is fine. He does his cardio. Like, that guy works out. <laughs> no, Scaven's like, great, yes, it was a good team fight. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that will be Senkux's reaction after he dodged out the fight as well. But still a winning fight in the top lane for Splice. They're about 3,000 gold ahead at the 16-minute mark. Massive, massive Carthus. You've got the Runic Echoes finished. You now have a Needlessly Large Rod alongside that Oblivion Orb. He's in a very strong spot, unlike Humanoid. Surprise. It's Prophet Kickus again. Chachi actually should just be able to kill Senkux straight up here. Put the fear beyond death. That's a very dead Senkux. Teleport coming in from Prophet. Chachi down to half HP. What did's on his way as well. Looking for the connection with the Winter's Bite. The flash already used from Chachi. There we go. Hit with the wolf in the back, and Chachi uh, eventually will just get stunned up here. No escape for him from the top lane, and Prophet will re reap the rewards. But meanwhile, uh, Kikis is actually getting walked down. Kikis needs some lessons from Senkux at the moment, because Senkux is the only one that can dodge this around. Kobe coming in. Xerxes will get the kill. Kobe gets the assist. Keep feeding that Karthus. Now 4-0-2 with the dragon spawning and Infernal in 30 seconds. That should be free for Splice. So again, while Prophet's feeling pretty high, pretty powerful, pretty good, uh, it's just him. The rest of the 
the team are still very well behind and they can't contest big objectives in a true 5v5. Not before the Karthus was fed and definitely not after the Karthus is fed. Mo get their first tower of the game as well just to try and get a little bit gold back in their back pockets. But as you say, if Xerxes anywhere near the fight and has popped his ultimate, Rogue are not winning that one. Actually, I'm gonna say this. Okay. Even though the Karthus is afraid, and Rogue definitely don't want to take a true 5v5, because they have Jace and Ezreal, as long as they have vision control, they could try to be greedy with trying to fight some of these monster objectives like the Infernal Drake and like the Baron. I think it's a bit too late because yeah, Spice Yeah, the done, Infernal Dragon's already dead. Well, Spice have done a great job with their vision. I mean, look at the bottom side of the map. It's lit up like a Christmas tree. Let's hold on. Yeah, he could just get chased out here. Good jump away from Norskaren. But as you say, yes. Splice did a good job with their vision. Rogue could have contested if they'd really wanted. And Rogue instead what they did, we're too late to the Infernal. They've already got complete control of that area. Let's instead move all of our vision towards the Baron, which is spawning in two minutes. And it does appear that they're maybe setting up, I'm gonna use the word trap very loosely, because Kikis isn't there. So I think Wadid and Hiku are just going on a, a bird watching adventure. <laughs> they're just kind of checking out what's happening in the jungle. Yep, they're in the river. Nice, nice, nice. Spotted a few. Do you spot a Xerxes? That's the big question for Rogue. If they don't, maybe they can win the fight, but even then, just sends down an ultimate and can totally change the tides of any battle that happens. He's currently sitting on uh, about 230 AP, six Dark Harvest stacks as well. Only going to accelerate when he gets that needlessly large rod next, you'd have to expect. And what Splice are trying to do is choke off Rogue from the top side of the map. You can see that Humanoid's up there getting the tower for free. So where well, Rogue had traded the Infernal Dra uh, Drake for vision on the top side of the map, it doesn't matter. Splice are strong enough that they can bully them around. And again, the only winning point on this map seems to be profit for Rogue. How much can he do in a side lane? We talked about wanting to see Rogue step up as a team, as a five man. At the moment, it's been all about kickers and profit working together in that top side. We've seen Senkux with some fancy feats, some fancy plays from him as well. But now is the time you want your five members to become greater than the sum of their parts if you're Rogue. But unfortunately, they don't have the parts in their items to really do something at this point in the game. Right now, Rogue kind of want to stall out as long as possible and start getting maybe another item, another uh, two items in the back pocket of Jace and Ezreal, which they do have a lot of wave clear. So they should be able to stall this out until the Baron spawns. And that 20 second window, that's when the game can really start to accelerate again, because then Splice have something that says, okay, Rogue, you can no longer just stay away from us. You must deal with us. Splice is trying to draw Rogue into a bad fight, into a bad position on the map. Soon we'll see, as there's a second need to see Large Rod for Xerxes, soon we'll see that Rabadon's death cap on the Carthus. And I know we've talked a lot about this pick, but it is the defining pick of the Splice lineup. Like, as soon as Xerxes got ahead, you're really on the back foot, you're backpedaling as Rogue to try and find a way into the game. With the Baron on the board, you have to expect that's where we're going to go next. Yep, and you've also got uh, now two items completed across the board. Splice just had a huge buy go in. They had the Gargoyle Stone Plate, as well as the Black Cleaver for Murgot. They've got the Zanya's the Protobelt for Lysandra, and the Black Cleaver and the Bork now completed for Lucian. So Splice was saying, just on time, Baron's popped up. We've got all of our items type, uh, topped off. Let's reset the map in terms of our minion waves, get everything neutralized, and then we're going to start moving into this Baron, moving into this Dragon, and taking whatever we want. A couple of interesting itemization choices I want to highlight just for the supports. Noskarin, instead of going Zeke's, has decided he's going towards the Locket of the Iron Salami for a little bit of extra Carthus. shielding against the poke. Uh, no, Noskarin, oh. though. You can't, uh, you can shield against your own I Carthus. I was thinking, like, get the Locket in there. Carthus is in the game. Like, get it, the Hex Drinkers. It makes a lot of sense. And actually, that looks to be what Wadid is going. He's going for the Redemption uh, second on, or first completed item on the Braum. So it gives them a little bit of extra regeneration against that Carthus ultimate. There's a lot of fishing here, is what I'm going to call it. Yeah. Both teams uh, recognizing that the big objective on the map has changed. It's mid tower and Baron. And if anyone oversteps a little bit and loses a fight, it'll surely be the big purple worm. When you're fishing, though, really you want just those long range skill shots to try and connect. You've got so much more poke on the side of Rogue in the form of the Mystic shot. You've got the uh, shot glass combination. Oh, Glacial Fisher doesn't quite hit Humanoid. And here comes the re engage from Norskare and. He's fishing for a fight. Profit on the front line, double knock up. Kobe gets the culling in from the side. Profit goes down, but it gets out as well. No Requiem used as of yet. Oh, true shot, Barrage. Oh! He caught himself a big fish with that ult. Oh, uh, just on the very tip there for Norskaren. He tried to turn out of the way, but that said, Splice still have the siege here and could look to go in. 
<laughs> Kick is coming in from the side. Chachi almost stunned up. Glacial Path used away from Humanoid, and Splice realized they cannot continue to push forward. No one low enough on Rogue to eat a Requiem. So much uh, poke potential from Rogue. The fact that they're able to consistently disengage from a Lissandra Alistar combination is quite impressive to lay down enough poke damage to kind of survive the tide of Splice. You've got to give Prophet credit in that last fight as well. He stood. He was that defining line between Norskaren, who jumped on his back line, and the rest of the Splice members. And because he was there, no one could really step past him. And again, this is buying Rogue time to get to those big item breakpoints for Jason Ezreal so those two can start hitting like trucks and continue to lay on this poke. So Prophet doing a good job, like you're saying, being that defining line, drawing it in the sand and said, no, no, we must hold them here because I need to buy time for my team. Almost at three items for HeQ. He'll get a tier next, you have to think, to go towards that Look Seraph's that double tier. Ezreal Humanoid takes a little bit of a chunk as does Xerxes. That's something we didn't really mention that much with Carthus. It's super squishy. And if you get caught out, you are going to die. Chachi flashes away. Kobe and going coming down from the mid lane, but Kobe goes back towards mid. He wants the push. They want the tower. Rogue here fighting over the Mountain Dragon. Yeah, it feels a little bit scattered from Splice. Well, you know, where are they going to attack on the map? Eventually, they decide to trade the Mountain Dragon for the mid tower. I really like that trade because, again, the Mountain Dra uh, Drake doesn't mean anything unless you get to use it offensively. Now, that said, Rogue on their composition with Ezreal Jace with also now damage or extra damage to towers, that feels great, but they got to get to the tower first. The question we asked for Splice before this game was whether or not they were going to be traditional, whether they're going to go, here's an AD carry, here's 40 minutes in the game, we've got three items. It feels like they've stepped away from that a little bit. More aggression from the Carthus in the early game, putting a little bit more impetus on Xerxes getting ahead, but they are still just trying to scale up. As soon as you get this Rabidon's Death Cat complete on the Carthus, they are in a very good position now to fight. Hold on, maybe a pick? Noskaren does still have the ultimate, but can be CC for quite a while here. Heq putting a lot of damage down. There's the Infernal Change, doesn't draw him back with the Glacial Pigeon. Will catch him out, and that's a good pick for Rogue. And unfortunately, just some inexperience showing from Noskaren. A bit too far down the lane. Good pick from Rogue, and it may turn into the tower. Tower oh, goes go. down. Prophet has to pop the World Ender. Requiem is available if they want it, but... Prophet, they're trying to just wait it out. Prophet needs to turn this one around because otherwise he's just not going to have enough health to survive through that Carthus ult. Chachi caught out. A lot of damage coming down. The knock of lands. Here's the teleport as well. Chachi, one more shot for the sun. There's the Requiem calling to the gods. But it's just stopped it. Oh my god, Kickers! You say you need to be counted. That's how you get counted. But now Splice, because of the overextension from Rogue, can just re engage. Who knows? Jumps in with the ice shard and we're dead. Trying to run away. We'll get to Prophet Glacial Path. We'll get the chase on. That's another good kill for Humanoid. Splice, turn the fight around. A hero play for from Kickers to make sure that he can try to save Prophet, but like you said, they just go a little bit too deep, and Splice are able to put them into the grinder, chop it up and spit it out, and they now move on to the Baron. And with the Karthus, with the Lucian, with Blade of the Room King, and with Alistar tanking as he hex flashes over the wall, they're going to be able to burn this very quickly. Yeah, Splice will get the Baron after what seemed to be the perfect fight for Rogue. They stopped the Requiem, they stopped all that extra damage, but they just took one step too far. <laughs> they do get the Baron in the end. Good stuff from Splice. 5,000 gold lead for them, 25 minutes in. I mean, frankly, I did not expect the game to go like this. I thought this was going to be just a wash, that Splice would take it very slow, that maybe Rogue wouldn't have any fight, and eventually Splice would just overwhelm and roll over them. I am so excited to see that Rogue actually do have some fire left in them, that we're seeing these mechanical outplays from the likes of Senkux, from the likes of Kikis. So this actually makes me more excited for Rogue, despite the fact that Splice are still firmly in the driver's seat. Oh, definitely. Like, if you can fight from this sort of position, in this sort of way, you have to have some faith in this organization. And credit to Prophet for his decision making here. He's like, I know that the Requiem's going to pick me off. I must turn it around. I have to get something back for this. And then he tries to basically say, I'm going to trade my life just to set up this fight, just to put us ahead. And then Kikis makes the hero play to interrupt with the flash on the Karthus. Xerxes thought he was po uh, poised far enough away from the fight that he would get the Requiem off, but Kikis finds him in that back line. Teleport from Humanoid into the fight as well made a big difference. Rogue look like they might be caught out a little bit here. Prophet does have the ultimate. We'll pop it at the last moment. Chase away from Splice. No one else down yet. He's got... Can he get back into the base? Requiem's about to come off of cooldown. I think that's longer than it would take for him to channel back. Of course, Requiem usually on very long cooldown. He will be running Presence of Mind to bring it down. But for the moment, not going to pop it. He does get back to base in time. Now with the Baron and... Past the 25 minute, it's very difficult to deal with the uh, minion pressure unless you are a composition that is Ezreal and Jace. So again, that abundance of wave clear may buy Rogue enough time to continue to put up a fight. Quite possibly. Spice still just pushing in this mid lane at the moment. You're looking at the waves in the side lane as well. Humanoid, a level advantage over Prophet right now. 
can just use those double cannon minions to push in the tower. Zerst, he's got caught. He's done. And a huge shutdown bonus that now goes into the hands of Ezreal exactly where he Oh my it. god, Sankux! That was unexpected. I thought with the Red Grim, everyone would just back off, but Sankux stayed around, tried to defend the tower. Now Kabi and Chachi can push forward. It's a 4v4. The bot lane is a 2v2, a 2v1 as well. And despite the fact that Karthus was picked off, I love the fact that Splice are cutting up the map. They're trying to separate all of this wave clear. They don't want Rogue to just kind of sit as Jace and Ezreal behind a single tower and clear out the, bin, uh, the Baron uh, cannon creeps. And so instead, by splitting up the map, they're making sure that they get a two for one special, the mid tower, the Sinkux, and the bot tower. Let's have another look at this, because it, it looks like Xerxes just missed positions and gets caught out. Good stuff from Kikis to find the pick. Just didn't spot Kikis until it was too late on that ward. So Xerxes thought that he had the vision underneath him, but Sejuani, good read, staying in Fog of War. That's Still. greedy from Sankux. Yeah. Karthus sends his regards. Yeah. You can see it coming. It's not like it's a surprise ultimate either. It's not hidden from you until you just take half your health. You can see it. You can, it's a big laser of doom on your face, Sankux. You can't dodge that one, okay? Maybe he thought he'd get his fancy feet back out again, get the tap shoes out. I don't think he was expecting uh, Kobe to be that on the mark, although should have. Yeah, Teammates. Exactly. And I mean, Kobe has consistently shown us that he is one of the more reliable members of Splice when it comes to late game. Often put the team on his back in 2018. He's done it a couple of times this split as well, or once this split. Nice thing, though, is that with the shutdown bonus again in Hiku's pocket on the Ezreal, he now has the double tier build up. So you can see that he's got the Archangels as well as the Muramana and the Iceborne Gauntlet. So a uh, good AOE spread from the Iceborne Gauntlet on his Qs that he can chip away at these minion waves. And with the double tier, it means that his damage will continue to hyperscale into late game. And he can be a very serious hyper carry threat if this game continues to drag on, which it's a splice game. So I expect it to. I mean, we're still about 10 minutes away from the average splice game finish time at the moment. So we've got a little bit more time before we get there. Interesting, we do talk about the extra gold going over to Hiku. He's still about 1,500 gold behind Kobe in terms of total gold. It's about a 2,500 gold difference between those mid laners as well and 2,000 in the jungle. And it's kind of about this idea of being on the clock versus ahead of the clock. So while, uh, you know, getting those shutdown bonuses are good, it feels that Rogue are on clock, that they're kind of right on time if the game was dead even, whereas Splice got a huge springboard and they're actually just ahead of the clock. That makes sense. So it, basically, we this is the position we'd expect Rogue to be in in an even game. And Splice have got so much extra gold that they're ahead of where I they will, should be. Exactly. But I'll say that for Hikyu. I think uh, Sinkux is a bit far behind. That makes sense. That but makes sense. And surprisingly so after how well he played in the early game, but was shut down. Uh, 1, 3, and 2 at the moment, about 20 CS down or so. It never feels good to first itemize into defensive items, especially on a champion like Jace, who wants to peak very early. And so I think that's also a big factor. Although, when his Shock Blasts do connect with a squishy target like Xerxes, he's still doing a considerable amount of damage. They still have a huge amount of poke on that team if they can get it to connect. They just need to draw Splice into a position where they're grouped up once again. That's what we want to see. You know, another Baron power play, another Baron play perhaps in a minute or so. Humanoid waiting over the corner here. No vision yet. There's the glacial path, but Humanoid's not going to follow it up. And you can see the poke onto North Scare, and Rogue will be pretty happy with the state of affairs. Their base isn't broken. They're only about 6,000 gold behind, which I know sounds like a huge amount, but actually isn't because of the way they're itemizing and because of the way they're scaling up. I also think because of the compositions. Again, there's not a traditional... I mean, they have Urga in uh, Alistar, but you're still looking at really squishy targets like the Lissandra, like the uh, Karthus, and like the Lucian. So it feels like the Ezreal uh, and the Jace are still doing a lot of damage. Hiku just delaying the back of Kobe there. Not really going to do too much, but maybe allow Rogue to keep this vision control around the bound, which is what they have for the moment. Chachi stepping forward. There's the top block. Kickers goes in. Glacial Prison lands, but they're not going to go too much further. Rogue wants to disengage this. Chachi on the way forward with Righteous Glory. Slow down. Hiku stepping to that front line. And it looks like Splice will just accept. They force Rogue back. They'll get some vision control once again. Humanoid jumps in, catches onto a did, the engage, there they go, North Scaven jumps in from the side, now Senkos trying to get on that backline, but he's out of position, this is a great fight for Splice, the Requiem comes out, Senkos already dead, HQ down to about 300 HP, he's caught out by Humanoid, and a superb fight from Splice in the mid lane, Prophet has to run for the wings, Kickers will do the same, Prophet might actually even be caught before he can get away, the World Ender comes out, but he's going to be resurrected straight into his own death, Glacial Path to follow him over, Humanoid with the chase, Prophet does have enough damage to take him out. Kick is just distracting Xerxes on the back line. Eventually, you'll feel Splice can just push this one down mid. I mean, frankly, unless Prophet takes them for a, a ride here, I feel like Chachi and Norse Karen, they're just trying to make sure that he doesn't get his back. But with the creep wave thinned out, I think Prophet might have bought them enough time. 
That's actually really good stuff from Prophet. Delay them enough. Kickers did the same, jumping onto the back line. Unfortunately, I feel like he finally led them to the, the objective like, that guys, they wanted. Here is your objective. But let me just uh, lead you to it. It's more tasty than I am. You want it more than you want me. So get distracted by it, and that will be the Baron going over to Splice. And now that's a double Infernal, Ocean, Mountain, what, second Baron for Splice? So well and truly on their way to snowball and close out this game. I thought they were going to disengage here. Uh, you can see we did steps forward and Splice just say, okay, we'll take you. It's just really hard to disengage from all of the engage tools and options that Splice have. Only, in, and really two champions, the Alistar and Lysandra, and those are the two that are leading the charge there. And then it's just cleanup crew from uh, Kabi and Xerse. Prophet does delay for long enough here. You can see Kickers as well on that back line, fighting off against Xerse for quite a while, but he just, he holds the wave. Xerse has to flash across. Good stuff from Prophet. You know, gets that final auto attack down. Able to get the kill, stops Humanoid, and maybe stops Splice from being able to have that full-on push. And that feels like a really good takeaway from this game, you know, win or lose for Rogue here, is that Kickus and Profit had have a really solid performance. They were constantly together, ganking all the time, able to stall out fights like this, and Profit sent wonders on this Aatrox. So with a 10,000 gold lead, you have to feel it's all but done for Splice here. Should be an easy enough close for them. You've got Muello, Nomicon, Void Staff complete on Xerxe, Void Staff on Humanoid as well. And we saw in that fight, unless Rogue gets some good poke off before the fight starts, Splice can just keep pushing forward and keep pushing forward and keep pushing forward, especially since you've got Kobe sitting 3, 1, and 6, 80 farm up with a thousand gold bounty. It's also that with a 10k gold advantage, their ability to just dive structures at this point in the game with Lissandra, Alistar, and Urgot, you know, there's no safe point for Rogue anymore. Eventually, Spice will just go. And Noskaren jumps in onto Hiku, who uses the Arcane Shift to get away. This tower down to about half HP. Humanoid into the backline. Copy there as well, but Kickers. There's the Requiem. One down, but who's going to fall to the Requiem? Already one down with a Fear Beyond Death. That's a good kill. Profit in the middle of all of Spice here. Senka's trying to get some poke down from the side as well. That inhibitor has to be the next target. Alongside Profit, Spice will take it down. They have a big, big minion wave. Will they go for the win? Still three members of Rogue left alive. And the primary wave clear options in Hiku and Senka can they hold on? You see the distraction trying to happen here from Kickers. Senkos and Hiku just running away. Kickers already down. The first Nexus Tower will fall as well. And Splice will finally close out this game a little quicker than they're used to. 34 minutes in, but the Carthus came online. And Xerse and Splice take their second win of the LEC. And we thought it was going to be Humanoid that might be the X Factor. But for me, it was Xerse and this Carthus pick. He did wonderfully through the jungle. Very fast tempo, picked up the first blood, and then just cleared cleaned it up in the team fights. Great stuff all around from Spice. And yeah, we talked about how we wanted to see something a little bit different from them. This isn't a total aberration. It's not a total divergence from the norm, but it's a little bit. It's a little bit of a change. And sometimes you can only change in little bits. Because if you try to change your whole game plan and say, we're only going to play early, it's too different for you. So I like this from Spice. A little bit of a change each week. And by, you know, week nine, week 10, maybe there'll be a full early game team. And at the end of the day, all that you can ask is that they beat the opponents in front of them. And you just got to win. Like a very controlled game from Splice, so well done. Good stuff all around from Splice. On the other hand, side of the coin, Rogue. Not as bad as we won. <laughs> that, that sounds really bad. I, I think if I'm looking at this as a Rogue fan or as a Rogue player, I'm buoyed by this. I'm, I'm a little bit happy because you didn't just collapse and you played the portions of the game that you wanted to the way you wanted to play them. And it kind of goes back into that idea that when you look at the individual pieces of Rogue, guys like Wadid, guys like Sengux, guys like Kikis, and now guys like Prophet, you know, you have these individual high moments from everyone. It's just, what do all those pieces look like together when Rogue is firing on cylinders, when Rogue is actually doing well? And that's the question that we're waiting for before we start putting all of our trust behind Rogue. Totally agree with you there, Fosk. I also want to give a little bit of credit to HeQ. Week one, he really struggled. He was down in lane. He got totally dominated by the Misfits bot lane. This week, he was he struggled a little bit, but he was much more consistent when it came to team fights. He was hitting those arcane shifts, uh, hitting those uh, true shot barrages and those mystic shots, and it was just a lot stronger from him all around. Yeah, I love the adaptation to uh, hold the lane phase until he could back on the Sheen buy as opposed to the tier of the goddess and make sure that he had some battle stats to try to keep up and stick with that Lucian dominant bot lane. So. I agree with you. Credit to Hiku. You know, he didn't have a terrible game. It's just, it's hard to shine on Rogue when they just get shut out like this. Definitely is. Let's have another look at that final fight. Uh, it was strong stuff from Splice, and you, you felt at this sort of point that the game was really done and dusted for them, but you do still have to close it out. 
The only thing that I think that I want a little bit more from Splice is just a bit more aggression from Humanoid. He felt really confident uh, on the Aatrox, and I didn't get that same confidence from Lissandra. Not sure what's happening in Calm, so it could just be that he's just listening and reading off of his team. And when you're that far ahead, you don't need to push the envelope. But for how important his responsibility was to that comp, I just feel like there was a bit uh, or some of the engagements were a bit missed, yep. and he was the main trigger on that Lissandra to force to speed up this game a bit more. Especially since you're looking at only one QSS on the side of Rogue. You only have the QSS on Profit. Sankalix has a cleanse, but if you can burn those early in a fight, you just give yourself so much more impetus to step forward and to continue to push the pressure down onto the enemy team. And like, overall, I think if you're Splice, you're happy with this. You're, you are acting probably at the edge of Gatekeepers, maybe. Wedding crashes or gate crashes, or whatever we want to call them. Like, this was better than a sixth place team, but not as good as a third, second, first, in my opinion. I was just impressed with what I saw from the jungle. It felt like uh, Splice were on the same page, that they were speeding up the game a little bit. Just, you know, again, there's some new blood on the team. We don't know what's happening in comms. Maybe a bit of stage fright, maybe just trying to find your groove in the LEC. But so far, I like what I see from the new iterations of Splice. And it's the right time to find your groove as well. It was still only in week two. Like, we can say these bold, sweeping statements, and I know I do a lot of the time. Splice but are going to Splice win. Splice are the best team in the league, but. <laughs> Remember to vote for your key player of the game at LOL Esports on Twitter. You can choose between the best players in the league, Xerxes, Humanoid, or Visit Chachi. I'd probably give it to Xerxes. I know picking Karthus Jungle kind of feels like a, oh, you picked Karthus Jungle, good job you won the game, but he also played it well. Yeah, and then credit to Chachi and Humanoid for making sure that Xerxes was set up for success, that he was able to pick up that first blood, that he was never invaded or pressured on the jungle. So I think it was a huge team effort from Splice, but it was definitely the Karthus pick that uh, was the primary carry and shown through. I think. There's an honorable mention here for Senkux as well, purely because of the fancy feet. Twice, he didn't have to burn his summoner because it was just like, guys, I don't know where I am. You don't know where I am. It's like, if you don't know where you are, they don't know where you are, you know? Just basically playing Twister is what it felt like. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Put your foot on the red skittle. Well, Dracos is standing by with Nilsko and Anne Vizicacci to talk about their win for today. Thank you very much, guys. I am joined by Norskaren and Vizicacci. It's good to have you both here. Now, first off, incredibly dominant win. Chachi, you got to be involved pretty much every stage of the game. Norskaren, it felt like you sat on your island in bot lane for a long time while Karthus was around that top side. How did the game go from your perspective? Uh, well, we won bot lane. We had a pretty good draft, I would say, and uh, our coaches were smurfing, I would say. And uh, yeah, I was just running through a river mid and uh, hiding on pink wards, I guess. There was not too much to do because my team was just too good, but we got a small lead bot lane and uh, yeah, our team was just carrying, kind of. All right, you're very casual about how you're describing this game right now. Were you more heated in-game? Were you more revved up? Or are you kind of the guy that keeps a cool head when it comes to in-game communication? Uh, I mean, last year I was really, like, uh, hyped all the time, but I think this year trying to keep it down a bit. But I got really hyped, at least when we started winning one fight, but calm down in the end, but yeah. Does that mean there's no more dab scaring? Are we, is, it's not coming back? Maybe one day. <laughs> Maybe one day. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Over to you, Chachi. Fantastic early game from you and Cersei combined coming to your lane to get that gank, to get the Karthus rolling. How much of your synergy that you guys built up on you, the Unicorns of Love uh, roster has kind of carried over to this new Splice lineup? Uh, I think already at the beginning when I joined the roster and we had our boot camp in December, uh, we could see that our synergy kind of carried over, but uh, something was a bit missing, which probably ha happened because we were uh, parting ways the last year. Uh, but I feel like during the bootcamp, we found back this synergy really fast and uh, during January, we are like having no problems communicating with each other and if something goes wrong, we are very fast to fix it. When you can see a lot of that on stage, it really feels like the duo is back together, I think, from an outside perspective, so it's a good look. Um, I'm curious for you, you played on a lot of different lineups from Unicorns of Love, jumping over to Schalke, now going to Splice. How does this team and this team dynamic compare to some of the other teams you've been on? Um, I would say right now the team we are having is probably the nicest team I've ever worked with. Uh, everyone is just so nice and open to each other. And I think this is extremely good for uh, improving in the long term. We are always open to discuss anything and uh, whatever the coaches say, everyone just takes it in. And uh, we have like open-minded discussions rather than people tunneling on their own visions and uh, saying that this is not how it is supposed to be, even though like it's really obvious that it is it is how it is supposed to be, and uh, I think it's pretty good so far. Once again, looking good. Now for you, Norse Karen, I think a first time here on the LSC stage, you've had to go up against former teammates. Does that weigh on you at all when you go in? Do you feel bad when, you, when you're smashing a game like this, or is it kind of you're not worried about it, they're enemies now, and you just keep going? 
Yeah, I guess the motivation is kind of a little bit higher. I mean, it should always be 100%, of course, but when you're playing against former teammates, you want to beat them a little bit more, especially Profit, a very good friend of mine. I really wanted to beat him, and I did, so I feel really happy right now. <laughs> I'm glad you pulled it out. He had a few highlight plays himself, so hopefully you won't feel too bad about that game. Now, the last thing that I want to talk to you guys about is that uh, general kind of opinions surrounding Splice, it feels like a lot of people are like, this team plays slow, no matter who is on this lineup, always the games are going long. Uh, some people are like, yay, late game team, they know what they're doing. Other people are like, oh God, Splice, please end the game. From your guys' perspective, as two new players, does it feel like you guys are a slow team or does this feel like kind of unjustified? Uh, I would say maybe people have this conception because right now, for example, if you take uh, this rogue game, uh, we had quite a few mistakes in the early mid game phase, which should not have happened. And that's what slows down the games and goes into late game. Of course, we kind of drafted uh, late game assurance, insurance uh, with Cartus. Uh, but I think uh, mostly games that go into the late game are uh, sometimes due to a team's uh, mistakes. And I think in this case it was that. But we are, of course, uh, looking to tidy up this early mid game. And, uh, if we manage to work on these the next weeks, I think we can be a very fast-paced team because we understand the fast rotations and uh, the fast-paced uh, macro moves. Uh, so I think we just need to work on that and understand uh, where we can get caught or where, we where the enemy can disrupt our plays because that's where we are a bit lacking right now. And these late-game scenarios, North Karen, always feel pretty tense, uh, except when you have obviously a massive gold lead from you. Do you feel comfortable if it goes to the late game, kind of making some of those risky calls, especially when you're playing a champ like Alistair and you know one engage can kind of decide a game? Uh, yeah, it feels really good like having the like, uh, impact. You can play a champion, can make an engage really well, or you can play like Janna and just wait for your team to carry. But I think in, in late game, it, it obviously gets more intense. But if you're really confident, I think uh, like if you make a, like a confident play or a confident call, I mean, you, yeah, I mean, it's, it should be really easy to end the game because if your team really like trusts you and you, you know you have the right idea, they will follow you and it should be easy then. All right, well, confidence definitely came through for you guys today. Congrats again on the win. Thank you for talking to me. But Splice, they're not gone yet. Up next in picks and bands, we're gonna have Kabi and Duke on the desk for G2 versus Excel. Don't go anywhere. As he puts down the wall of Hayward, did have this flash still. There's the culling. But it should survive the ignite ticking away. Oh, Requiem. Goodbye, Wooded. Judge has got the teleport in. Say a prayer to your gods, because the Requiem comes down. And Zersa obliterates the health bars of Rogue. Humanoid jumps in, catches onto Wooded. The engage. There they go. North Scaven jumps in from the side. Then Senko's trying to get on that back line, but he's out of position. This is a great fight for Splice. The Requiem comes out. Senko's already dead. He down to about 300 HP. He's caught out by Humanoid. Splice will finally close out this game a little quicker than they're used to. 34 minutes in, but the casters came online and Zerse and Splice take their second win of the LEC.